everyone. In just a minute, I am going to be interviewing Layla Ibrahim. And I want to see this picture. Her newest book is called uh, Mustard Seed, and it is crazy good. Okay, this is her second book, and it's kind of a sequel, which I didn't know at the time, so I hadn't read the first one. But just look at that. She will have the physical copy, I'm sure. And I'm just keep getting glares. But anyway, it's set after the um, Civil War and it's set in Virginia. And I never read a historical fiction book about that time period and how people were adjusting because it was like three years after the Civil War. And um, I, I really, I mean, Virginia, it was hard because there were people on both sides and how families moved on and how friends moved on. And, and anyway, I can't wait to talk to Layla. And I think that's how I say it. We were going to find out if that's how you say it. But um, anyway, here she is. Hi, everyone. Today, I am so excited to be speaking with author Lila Ibrahim. And her newest book, which she's going to hold up because I have it on my phone, is called Muster Seed. I love, love, love that cover. I mean, it says so much and everybody that reads it will understand how much that cover says, <laughs> but it's such a cool cover. And, um, I am so happy I found you because yeah, they did a great job of it. Yeah. yeah, I am so happy I found you because this book was so cool. It was so amazing. I love historical fiction, but I've never read a book that talked about the period right after the civil war. And what happened? And as I'm reading it, I was thinking, why didn't, you know, it's not the stuff you learn in history. It was like civil war over. Everybody's happy. We move on. <laughs> and, and, and that is not what happened. <laughs> it's not what happened. And it explains a lot about how, why we are where we are right now. Right. But, and then that gap, that gap of thinking like, Oh, the civil war ended. Slavery was over. Hooray, hooray, freedom. And like, wow, actually, we had some big moral failings as a country in that time period. Yeah, and um, so I didn't realize that there was a first book. <laughs> and I wish I would have because I would have read it. But I guess you start off the story with these characters in that book. And I wanted to ask you before we get talking about this book, just to set the scene up, is that you took it right after I mean, that book was kind of like before or during or how did you do that? Yeah, so that book started in 1839 or so with the birth of a child. Okay. So it started with Lizbeth's birth, and at the moment of birth, she's taken away from her biological mom, Mrs. Ann, and handed over into the care of a wet nurse, Maddie, who had to leave her son behind in the quarters, her four-month-old baby, to come be the wet nurse for Lizbeth. And almost in spite of herself, Maddie falls in love with this little baby and Lizbeth doesn't know anything about these circumstances and why it's a strange situation to be growing up in. For her, it's just normal. But as she moves into adulthood, she's basically taught that she needs to disavow Maddie's very personhood, her humanity right. to take her place in society. And she comes very close to doing that. And then she experiences a traumatic event that causes her to reevaluate her whole situation. And so she leaves the plantation that she grew up on, does not marry the person her parents expected her to, ends up traveling to Oberlin, Ohio, which was an extremely progressive and liberal community at the time. Yeah, because they yeah. picked that place because they did progress very quickly, right? Like they, they caught on a lot quicker than the rest of the country as to what it was going to look like with schools and and. You know, churches God. and yeah, the, the people who started Oberlin College are the same people that the town of Oberlin, they were started by the same people and they were very progressive Christians and they felt like they wanted to make basically um, um, what we would call beloved community or, you know, heaven on earth, be living out their Christian values and creating a society that was egalitarian for them. So women were admitted to Oberlin right away. African-Americans were admitted to Oberlin right away, which is just stunning um, when you think about it. But it is a school and a community that did make a difference in our country by having this stance. So many people who were abolitionists and many people who were suffragettes came through Oberlin. How did you find out about that? 
You know, I just had known that Oberlin was a very liberal community. I knew that it was on the Underground Railroad. I knew that it was a college that early on admitted, you know, blacks and women. I didn't realize it was like at the founding. And to be honest, even so I ended Yellow Crocus in Oberlin. Mm -hmm. I did not realize there was one elementary school and there was one church in the town when I ended it there. I didn't realize it was quite that progressive. So in some ways, when I end Yellow Crocus, it's almost, I don't end it quite right once I learned that new information. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, so I was very grateful for it. And you know, Ohio's right next to West Virginia, and I almost set Yellow Crocus in West Virginia, but then I learned that it, I needed to be, the plantation system didn't happen in West Virginia. It doesn't have the right um, conditions for mm -hmm. large plantations. There were small farms with enslaved people, but there weren't like the large plantations with 80 or 100 slaves. And I, I definitely wanted Yellow Crocus to be set on a plantation with a lot of slaves. So hence it's in Virginia. Is it too much of a spoiler to tell me why um, Yellow Crocus, the, the title? No. So okay. um, basically, so my degree is in child development and I studied attachment theory way back when. And um, so... It, 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 I'm, it, so the yellow crocus is the symbol, symbol of the uh, intergenerational attachment, transition, transmission of attachment. So this was something that Maddie learned, a tradition that Maddie got from her mother, who got it from her ancestors, and she passed it down to Lizbeth, who passed it down to Samuel, her son, and then her daughter later. So, um, and it just shows like where Lizbeth's basically parenting and culture actually came from like it really didn't come from her biological parents um, because her mother didn't even remember her own mother and her mother didn't even remember her own mammy right so her witness was sold when she was four years old she never saw her again so you know so she has an, uh, uh, basically an avoidant attachment relationship she has nobody older than her that she feels connected to um, and so that that that's a symbol of that. Right. Did you yeah. do it in um, the different parties like you did in Mustard Seed? Did you do it in the different voices? Did you? Yeah, it's, it's mostly Maddie and Elizabeth quite as tight as Mustard Jordan in one chapter, Elizabeth one chapter, Jordan one chapter, Elizabeth. Um, but it's pretty close to that. And there is, it's interesting to go back and read it because at the beginning, I thought Anne was going to be a major character in the first book that I was going to think about the triangle and what it was like from each of their perspectives. Um, cause I do think Anne was harmed in this system as much or even more than Maddie and Lizbeth. Like it, right. it just took away her very humanity and her sense of connection. Um, relationships, love, all those things were missing from her life. So, um, but then she just kind of fades away. Like I don't actually tell much from her point of view, except at the very, very beginning. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I opened the, I got lots of recommendations for this book, just so you know, that's how I find books. I do because I start to know, especially, especially when it comes to historical fiction, because all you have to do is go on my YouTube channel and you'll see all these historical fiction people like and then everybody's like oh i know another one oh i know someone and i get referred and they're like oh you, did you read mustard seed i'm like no and so okay so i open it up and just for everybody out there i wanted to read how this book starts and and for everybody who doesn't know matthew 17 20 because this is mustard seed this is how you get the title and this is how the story begins it says i tell you the truth if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you can say to this mountain move from here to there and it would move and i was like oh, i love that i mean i know that verse but i love that the book started off with that verse because right then and there you're understanding that oh, this is going to be, you know, a little bit about faith. And this is going to, you know, this book is going to be, you know, that it starts out like that. And I just love that you started off the book like this. I mean, and I am definitely, Lila, I'm like, I'm going to go buy mustard seeds. <laughs> I am not even kidding you. Because the way that you put it throughout the book, I was like, what a great idea. What a great idea to just remember, because like I said, I knew this verse, but like on a daily basis to have that memory of like, oh, right, right. It's, it's faith. I just have to have faith. I can do this, you know? So yeah, yeah, I am yeah. So that, that tangible reminder. That's so great. I love it. I know. And I'm so happy that I got to, you know, meet you and read this book because it's, it is a book about faith and, but I became so connected with each character story 
and even not having read the first one, it didn't matter. And, you know, that is very difficult. It's very difficult for somebody who's written, you know, let alone, you know, just a two part, but any kind of series, you want them to be standalone, but I didn't even realize that it was a part and you didn't smother me with details of like, oh, and then in the first book, this happened. And then, you know, <laughs> and that's hard that's to do. So right. You know? Yeah, that's, that's so great. great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm really, 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 really glad to hear that. that. Yeah. Goal. And it was hard. Actually, found, I can't remember now who I found, but I found a couple people who hadn't read Yellow Crocus and asked them to read Mustard Seed so that I could have a sense of that. Yeah. Right, right. Because it must be yeah. hard for you because you're like, when you're writing it, you're like, okay, you have to sprinkle the information in so that people understand the backstory without, you know, sounding like, okay. And basically, like, I feel like I could go read Yellow Crocus now. Like, and I want to. When I'm on a beach and I don't have to do this, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me see. Okay. So I found another quote that I liked. I'm a quote person. So I start writing down. That's what I do. I start writing down things. Um, it says, you don't have to know how or why faith works. You just have to got. Wait, I think I was doing it in her like tongue. You just got yeah. to make sure you find some when you feeling lost. That is so awesome. I love that. <laughs> I love quotes that make me stop and put the book down. And then, you know, I just think, and I'm like, yes, yes, Lila, I do. <laughs> You're talking to me, okay? That's so great. I know, that's what I love about Maddie, because I can just put these profound words into Maddie's mouth, and they just seem so right. And, and you do just realize, like, people in her position just – that's what they have to, they, I mean, they had to dig in and have faith and have faith in, in a world that they were never, ever really going to experience or that they didn't know that they would. And that, I don't know, it just seems beautiful to me. And it's part of why I think I needed to like dig back into that kind of story. Like what, in some ways I live such an amazing privileged life and I forget to hold on to faith, even though I'm really not that far from having exactly what I want almost all the time. So. I mean, it, it makes me like just tear up because, because I, when you said it in her voice, I knew because how do you think they did it? You know, when you sit back and like you said, when you look around, like, how do you think they did it? And really, you know, we can hear the stories and we can hear history and read civil war books and, you know, and everybody's like, Oh, oh that's so horrible. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to. But when you think about the take one person and, and make it human you know, because as a group, when you, you when you kind of collective, uh, you know, make it collective and be like, okay, yeah. they were all free. They should be happy, right? Like, they should all be happy yeah. now and rejoicing and, you know. But when you hear the, like, the, the personal stories about her son and her family and you're like, wow, like, they really did that? You know, it just makes it way more real. And you're, and you, you know, you take a step back and you're like, I did not learn that in history class. I really didn't, you know. Right. It's not yeah. something. No, and what's, what's amazing, amazing is even, I'm not even, I didn't, but like, I didn't either. And I'm someone who's thought a lot about how race functions in America. I've read a lot of slave narratives. I've read a lot about the Civil War. And then, and then I thought, wow, I guess I, I can't remember exactly where it was, where I, oh, I know what it was. I was listening to Brian Stevenson on the radio, who's written, a, wrote a book, um, I think it's just Mercy is the name of his book. But anyway, he's someone who gets people off of death row now. And he said it is far better to be wealthy and guilty in the United States than it is to be poor and innocent. And I was like, oh, yeah, you needed to get a law degree to know that. I mean, I couldn't believe how snarky I was listening to this. And I thought, oh, my gosh, it's not the country I want to be living in, where I go, well, yeah, it's better to be wealthy and guilty than innocent and poor. Wow. And so then it just started me thinking about, like, how do we get into this situation where that's true? And it's not what we're told about our country, right? It's not what we want to believe about our country. Um and then people kept asking me, like, well, what happened? Will you write a sequel? I want to know what happened to them. And and so then I just started kind of reading about that time period and then reading, thinking about, yeah, what happened to Elizabeth's family as she left. And I was just blown away when I realized, you know, it's all in my own head. But still, when I realized that they were so shunned that they lost their plantation. 
And it's like, of course that happened to them. Of course everybody was like, you are out. Right. Right. I mean, there was, it was tragedy all the way around. It yeah. really was, yeah. you know, and, and I love how you put the soldier, Absolutely. you know, the soldier in there because, you know, if we watch, you watch any Civil War movie, you do see, like, that these soldiers, I mean, that they have to go home and, you know, they don't have, they don't get PTSD um, extra pay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I'm not even, I have two sons that are vets, so I'm not, you know, I'm not even saying anything about that, but it's true. You, they didn't, it wasn't like a thing. Okay. They had to deal with what they had to deal with without anybody understanding and, and family, you know, family's not even understanding because some of the family leaves, some of them, you know, they know that they're on the other side and, you know, it was the worst, worst war ever. But, you know, I love how you, you brought in all the different components so that you could see everybody's story in this. And you know, want to know a secret? I hope it's a movie. I hope somebody picks this up. Yeah, I, I hope so too. That would be so great. So for all those people out there that have, you know, a couple million dollars to throw into a movie, I really do because this would be an amazing movie. It really would. Never Thank saw you. anything like it. So, anyway, moving on. I have all my notes here. Um, great. So I looked up, um, you know, some stuff about you and and the fact that how you came to be a writer because now you're writing full time, right? I'm <laughs> It's just crazy. It's crazy. I used to be a preschool teacher. I'm like, That's oh my awesome. gosh. That's awesome. I have some grandchildren in preschool right now, so I just want to tell you how awesome that is because I know how they are. So. You know, I, I really loved it. It was so much fun, you had your but own it was a lot of work and exhausting, too. Yeah, you weren't just a teacher. You had your own school. I had my own school, right. right. Exactly. So right. I worked with the teachers nice. and the kids and the parents and, yeah, the families. And it was great. And it was so satisfying, but also just exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Four-year-olds are fun. You know, I have, I have three, well, my one granddaughter just turned five, but there were three four-year-olds at the same time. And it amazed me how, you know, they would get back from preschool and their parents would be like, you know, what'd you learn today? And they're like, you know, stuff you don't know, please. Like I'm smart now and you are not smart because I've learned stuff today. I know four-year-olds have such attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. My four-year-old granddaughter was telling me I made F's wrong. She was like, oh, Grandma, that is not, that's not how I learn in preschool, and I think they're right, so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a great age because they're so teachable, and they want to be, you know, they're so, they want to suck up all this knowledge, you know, like, I want this, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I'm yeah. sure that's why you had so much fun with them, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, and they, they can, can just flip into fun and imagination just any, at any moment, which I just love. Yeah. yeah. So then you start writing, when did you start writing Yellow Crocus? So I, I focused when I was 33, and I was like, I am not, I mean, I couldn't imagine why anybody would write a novel. Like, I, I was not a fiction writer, I, I was pretty good at like so my degrees in psychology and I was good at that technical writing um but I could not imagine why anybody would ever like write a novel and then these but the characters just kind of so the three characters Miss Anne, Maddie and Elizabeth were just in my mind and and there it was that birth scene that popped into my head and I was like wow what happened to them and I I, I really kind of wanted to know what what, what would make someone like Lizbeth not just keep to the path, like keep to the path that her family set out for her and what made most people go along with supporting the system of slavery and what made a few people fight against it or abandon it. In her case, she abandoned it. She didn't really fight against it, but she did abandon it. And um, so I was just kind of curious about that. And see, I'm like in the middle of the night, I'd wake up and a scene would pop into my head and seven years for seven years, I would look, I'd go to libraries and, and look for this book. This is like before the internet, I'd look for the book and be like, <laughs> okay, someone else must have written this book. And I would ask people if anyone's ever written this book, things like that. And I just couldn't find it and couldn't find it. So I had all these friends that ran marathons when they turned 40. And I was like, I am not running a marathon when I turn 40, but I'm going to try to write that book. So I sat down right before my 40th birthday and wrote, you know, started working on the book. And, um, the first 
kind of pass at it literally was 12,000 words that included the beginning all the way to the end. So it was like a novella. And I, I gave it to about four people. And I said, you know, read this and tell me whether this is just the most ridiculous idea in the world or I should keep going. And, and um, two of them were like, I stayed up all night trying to, I just couldn't go to bed till I found out what happened. And I was like, Oh, I think I might have something there. So I had to learn how to be a writer, but I did it. And at this point, at that point, there was no way to like, this is before the Kindle. This was before create space. I, you know, sent it off to agents, sent it off to publishers, had no nibble or I had nibbles. I had nibbles, but no takers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ended up self publishing it. And then, um, as a fluke, I, I checked the Kindle. I was like, sure, make a Kindle version. What do I care? And then that's how I really started selling it was via the Kindle. And I I kept marketing it and asking bloggers to review it and things like that. And then after I had managed to sell about 50,000 on my own, and that's when the publisher approached me and republished it. So that's why there's two covers. So there's the cover that I did when I self-published it. And then the cover when um, Lake Union picked it up. Well, I'm really, I really hope that a lot of new authors are listening to this because I do think that publishing companies are coming. I think that they are looking now for people who are self-publishing because, you know, and there's a lot more publishing companies, but I, you know, I think they're looking and if they see that on your own, you can sell that many company, uh, that many, that many books, they're like, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, maybe let's look at this again. And so that's very inspiring for any new authors. Yeah, yeah no, my understanding is they're doing that actually a lot, that a very high percentage of, of books that publishers are publishing, they're republishing and just have a bigger marketing arm. Right. And, wow. and so now you have it. Now you've got that. So what are you doing next? Is it, is it? Like- so I, at this point, I'm most of my way through my, what would be my fourth novel. And it um, is, so I got a two book deal for Mustard Seed, the sequel to Yellow Crocus, and then Anything Else I Wanted. So the Anything Else I Wanted is, um, I'm, the working title right now is Paper Wife. I think that's going to be the final title. And it's about a paper wife um, who's a young woman who immigrates through from southern China through Angel Island in the San Francisco Bay to San Francisco and then to Oakland, which is where I live in Berkeley. So it's looking experience in the early 1920s at a time when um, migration was being restricted uh, in the United States. Wow. And then I think I'll return back to Jordan's world. Yes. That's yeah. what I wanted to hear. Because, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not a, you know, if it's not going to be a blockbuster movie, it could be a mini series, you know? Yes. It could be like a yeah. series. And that, you know, now that all yeah. these, you know, Amazon and Netflix are all making these like series things, you know, I could see it definitely, yeah. especially because it covers a time span, you know? I yeah. That. Yeah. No, and I actually want to go all the way to the modern era. So I have ideas about their descendants and stuff. So I'm excited about that. So in um, Paper Wife, do you remember that, um, Matthew's brother moved to Oakland. Yes. Probably not. Probably the stand out. Okay. So he moved to Oakland and he, he's working in, um, he's going to end up having a produce store, a produce um, market, like a wholesale produce market. And that is where my character's husband is going to be working. So it's kind of fun to already have kind of connected those two worlds together. <laughs> I love seeing your enthusiasm about it too. You're like so excited. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just awesome. Like, you know, the fact that this is like a dream come true and you're actually writing all the time, you know? It's crazy. Yeah. I feel so blessed. It's really awesome. And to be able to put my values out in the world, like you were saying, like you can see that this is a spiritual book, that this is about faith. And, and if you read any of my books, you'll see that that's very much true. And for me, it's just this kind of amazing thing that people find faith in hard times and that people, you know, make new home and make new family and that the family you make isn't necessarily the family you were born into, but you still can find that connection and that community to support you through life. Right. And what I loved about it was it wasn't like it was hitting you over the head with, it wasn't like she was just spouting off, you know, different things. I mean, uh-huh. It was yeah. like, it was so appropriate when she would say it. And it was like, that's why you kind of grabbed onto it. Because, yeah. you know, it wasn't like she was walking around being some kind of, you know, preacher and preaching to everybody. But she, it was like she had the exact right thing to say at that at t- different times, you know. And it was yeah. like, yeah. yes, 
you know and that's why when she speaks everybody kind of listens like that, huh, yeah you know so that's what i loved about it you know but that's anyway great. hold up the cover again i am so happy okay. i got to talk to you lila i am you so are the happy first that I person about it's, it's only, only been out a month so you're it early has. on the train so it that's has. awesome it has but you know what go on amazon everybody because the reviews are amazing you're getting so much love over there and i'm gonna have all of your links so they can find you and um right you know for for it only being out for a month i mean it's doing amazing so you must be thrilled. it really is doing amazing i am i just feel so blessed and so yeah so happy that people are responding to it and responding to it in its own right right that, that people who love yellow crocus love it but like you're saying you could read it as a standalone and that's just amazing and, and, you know, when yeah. people start carrying around mustard seeds, like I'm going to do, and it becomes this, like, oh, you can I be love like, that. <laughs> because I'm going to tell everybody, I, you know, trust me, everybody, I'm going to just carry, because you know what, you can get like a bottle, you know, at the, at the grocery store, and you know how many are oh. in one of those bottles? Tons, okay? <laughs> I know I'm just gonna hand them out to my children. They're gonna be like, "What?" I'm like, "Just, just carry it. Just think about it when you're when you get you know when you get upset. Just hold on to that." And I love that. I always love that verse, but now I love it even more. So I thank you for that. You're so welcome. Well, it was nice meeting you, and I can't wait to read so your next nice book. And just you know where to find me because I will read it. Great. Please do. And then we can talk again. So anyway, have a great night, okay. Lila. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye. bye. Wasn't that an amazing interview? Oh my gosh. Lila is so sweet. And I just want to tell you guys, get that book. Okay. Mustard Seed is an amazing book and it's about faith and it's about family and um, her writing is amazing. And I'm so happy that I got to meet her. I feel so blessed and I can't wait to start passing around Mustard Seeds because I am. So um, for my children who are watching this, you will be getting some of those. So anyway, thank you guys. And um, if you like the video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Thank you.